Hello everyone, today we talk about the institutional apparatuses and royal officials in the monarchic states of the 12th and 13th century. Um, it's European history. We already talked about the peripheral officials um, in these essentially feudal monarchies some time, you know, remember, some, some months ago. And you know that um, even though I haven't classified it yet in a, in a playlist on its own, we do talk about uh, the uh, essentially the medieval government mostly, and so also state building and how this proceeded over time. Sometimes videos like these are necessary even just in a not much in a politically theoretical but also in a broadly um, comprehensive and general outline because if one gets like we were uh, doing the other day for example about I don't know the Burgundian state uh, administration and government uh, very in-depth uh, in the properly in how was that specific place ruled right but uh, we lack we can lack easily through it the, the broader picture and so the ability to relate to to the world which is the only way you can actually give a dimension right also a value and appreciating it in, in a historical sense um, so even though I'm not a fan myself of <laughs> you know these topics just per se actually they're, they're interesting right but sometimes they can get to the limit of rarefaction and so you wonder why they're necessary well because in the hierarchical order that I'm giving to the various uh, content we do need to to have a talk uh, about these topics conceptually right and just to make people sometimes coming down to earth even though they seem kind of hyper uranian topics by by some degree um, to uh, to to say look that um, things generally speaking work in similar ways right and so this scale of generality is the measure that you have to use uh, for a first of all for, for history as a whole because this is not just about looking within medieval history as we mostly do just because I'm a medievalist but it can be useful um, also, I don't know, from, from a contemporary perspective, to, to look at the Middle Ages. Sometimes, in the past, uh, I, I noticed that um, the many of the, in fact, most specific mechanisms of medieval government and, um, you know, I, I would call it politics, but I, I would like to stress the, the, the practical side of, of this cut, um, are misunderstood. Right in the first years of Schwerpunkt, I tended to talk more in general uh, about topics that again could seem like to, uh, you know, sometimes uh, distant from pop culture, but exactly for that could be mistaken for like, oh my God, you know, this guy studied the whole thing, so he knows so much in general. Well, no, sometimes this is just manualistic stuff that you must know in the first place at the beginning, and then starting to appreciate and, and realize it um, uh, in, in many ways just later once you have gotten in the the, the actual specifics so that you can go back and say yeah so you can even make comparisons not necessarily being satisfied with that um, uh, simple theory which sometimes is oversimplified I warn about that it, when you read a, a medieval history manual the ones you can use um, at university in the first years, etc. Um, most of that is so vague, not because it's um, just rarefied in, in that way, but because even those people who write the manual usually are not specifically competent anymore in, in a diachronic and comparative way um, in, in the various times and places of, in this case, medieval history. Meaning what? Meaning that maybe they just specialized in a given country, in a given century, and they literally don't know much else of that. They just have these broader reminiscences from manuals themselves uh, that back in the day that, you know, like you mostly do at 
in that age you, you tend to learn by heart right or to acquire as a sort of in fact a foundation that's why we we use them in manuals but quite passively and considering the past generations in a somewhat um, structuralistic way that is to say uh, as I tend not to do in fact myself when I make this kind of videos uh, this was just like um, the deal per se um, and you don't have to even think there is something beyond this concept uh, at least these manuals do not mm, spark you they don't suggest they don't hint at any of that because very often they they also dialectically have that uh, need of um, uh, of clarity and self conviction let's say for the the, the wild approximations that they make and this is valid uh, in general for for all history like what I mostly complain um, about the, the the way we 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 make history nowadays it seems to me is that um, we in fact lack that interest or knowledge of um, of of the world like especially I don't know medieval history you, you should know well at least Europe if you are a Westerner right you can't say I don't know I especially I just I, I come from this country so I studied just that country and I think that everything revolves around that right the more you do that this that this is valid also for the personal interest right that's something I always say about um, what I get mostly statistically from 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 the audience here is, is that people tend to watch stuff that that just pertains to whatever they personally think it's important and not because that has actually an objective value most of it it's you know if it's my country I'm interested otherwise not if you reason like that uh, bail out of history immediately like it's completely useless for you to first of all to listen to me um, but also to anything else historical and um, secondly it means literally that you don't know anything about your own country as well because um, you cannot appreciate anything if you don't have a comparative capacity um, and this may not just be of course uh, kind of chauvinistic um, moral subjectivism and paranoia and need to you know aggrandize oneself through the you know the fantasy view of what you think your country was in the past this is literally coming from the way we are told history nowadays I mean there are literally some chunks of medieval Europe that um, and I'm not just talking about necessarily time and place per se but literally what actually happened in a concrete political and social way that are completely non-existent in popular culture right as I often say I'm given that instead I take um, you know on this task of covering practically everything uh, from the medieval with important differences as you know it's because I also end up to you know concentrate where either historiography has found more but sometimes also in um, from, from different national perspectives uh, that naturally treated history differently but that also are not represented um, in popular culture which which doesn't mean like that you have been told that you know we're making I don't know minority policy or anything and that quite the contrary that is to say there are some massive um, arguably even some of the most important chapters in medieval history that have that are widely known to be so academically but that pop culture does not receive for reasons that again I could make entire videos on and it, it's sometimes painful but it shows you how immoral and unscientific fundamentally popular culture is so you cannot keep fueling your own um, emotionalism and uh, again uh, subjectivism and relativism uh, and more because you 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 want to think that there are things in the past that literally never existed but you must think they did because otherwise you would feel nothing right you would be revealed in your true face um, that's uh, that's risky right that's uh, essentially the possibly the greatest or at least the consequence of some of all of the weakness uh, at the end of the day of one of the most impacting uh, immune um, mental diseases that we have um, 
today, politically and, and socially. It, it encompasses every people, every country. Uh, it's, um, it's, I can't say it's even stronger in the West, because actually in the West we are more aware, at least a, a tiny fraction of the population, is more aware, of course, of scientific standards, of moral standards in a way that you don't find anywhere. So um, arguably we are the ones that still write history to the, to the highest degree that has ever been discussed. But even within us, there are like those people who think that, I don't know, there is a, a, malign, a malignant um, conspiracy theory about how we even write history now, as if, you know, they had even read any of that, right? It is true that there is um, a, a massive cultural influence in some economies that are declining rapidly in quality, etc. But, you know, these are, the good historiography is there, and we keep making them, and it's always, fortunately, um, up to the standards that we would like to. Again, this, this does vary, but there is no comparison between what we get, um, say, in pop culture and what we get academically. So first, b before criticizing academia, first, first of all, read it, right? Because we all know that you don't, <laughs> right? And so, and, and especially those who write that know it better than others. Um, and you'd be surprised by how much, how sp much space there actually is for, first of all, good research, but probably research just in certain in certain fields because um, you think we know history but it, it's not quite true right at least we don't know it to to a degree at depth um, a comparative um, in fact in diachronic level that you would you know you would think it's already been assessed right this is typical of people that don't get into it they think that somehow there is an absolute knowledge and that we it's been it's a matter of fact right and you can essentially hyper simplify that uh relativistically by pretending that you know everybody knows it even though you haven't again even browsed uh you know the the the, the basic works on, on on the matter so that you can eventually start saying that again there is a kind of evil influence even on it as if uh, uh, it could be dominated by an entire thought that is monopolizing people's um, behaviors, all this kind of stuff. But it is happening. You find it everywhere, you find it at every level. Same goes for science. Um, the same goes for, which is the same thing with history, by the way. Um, but yet this is another topic I'm not to discuss today. In other words, um, never think that you have arrived anywhere because you haven't even started. Doesn't depend, on, you know, which point of your life you are uh, at or what you actually did. Um, it's the same situation by approximation, which doesn't mean, of course, that there aren't ma to, in proportion to the absolute. That doesn't mean there are massive, radical, Im impacting differences between individuals' knowledge, right? So that we don't float, you know, in a space where you just know a bunch of stuff and you become an expert, right? Nor experts are of the same caliber, nor um, reading or listening to them makes you an expert, right? But coming back to our topic, I like a bit of a ramble in the, I would like to say in the morning to, to copy Apocalypse Now quote, but you know, it's actually evening here and uh, before starting the video, but uh, I think it's necessary. And as far as this t today's topic is concerned, uh, we have seen in other videos since this, sometimes even the beginning of the channel, the, the one about feudal monarchies and and even just some you know historical region series we've done more recently, just to give more more specific examples that we see that in fundamentally Western Europe, this is the the concept that could be extended by degree beyond but definitely that's where the most intense things happened for reasons that fundamentally stem again from the development of the vassalatic beneficiary system as a post Carolingian system um, and thus in a feudal sense because um, there were elites who had a lot right most people wouldn't but this brought essentially to have a more hierarchical system that could um, essentially channel, direct, catalyze this enormous 
growth that was was happening substantially in the content that however needed a form right to uh, to, to stabilize it to, to use it uh, to the best purpose uh, etc right naturally it's not just feudalism right there is a, as we've seen a lot of for example uh, urban communities uh, there is surely an influence that this system receives from from the outer side but mostly it's an internal system that um, backs itself right in even through conflict wars um, a tremendous competition etc but strengthens the European continent in the high middle ages in a way that is objectively not to be found I, I, I'm not aware of comparatively of another um, time in history where things uh, like in such short such short amount of time essentially accelerate it um, and not to literally remain like that f till to this day we, we had um, some crisis we've seen it very clearly at the same end with middle ages um, but this system laid the foundations for the further development as well so that medieval civilization fundamentally didn't collapse uh, at least in a uh, transfiguring way like it happened in late antiquity there would be a lot to say about this because um, that's also an, a bit of a narrative but indeed there was a contraction let's put it like uh, that in which you know in late medieval times however what had been laid before continuous expanding right so and exactly mostly on the basis of these states that were established uh, and reinforced during the high middle ages and today we look at the latter half of the, of the high middle ages so the, the 12th and the 13th century are not just a moment of the the actual boom the greatest acceleration but also the ones in which monarchic states um, start to delineate essentially some territorial political and organizational systems um, aimed of course at ruling the the communities in a more um, coherent concentrated um, and efficient way right um, the two centuries um, following this would uh, witness the stabilization of monarchic regimes uh, around a complex and articulated institutional apparatus right that mostly derived in there from the necessity to um, to, to escape the crisis to have an authority that could provide protect and that opens to the early modern age in which you can find a divide between those parts of Europe that had basically undergone this essentially subtle development in high medieval times and those who wouldn't and that fundamentally would um, collapse or remain particularly uh, fragmented right so what happened in in the in 12th 13th century instead was uh, the the foundation of, of most of what we call in fact properly modern um, European countries right in talking about modern not the anglo-american way modern literally in the you know up, up to the essentially the French Revolution right so uh, that chronological cut um, and um, this um, the, the latter phase um, naturally so this monarchic regimes also capable of balancing out the the forces the communities um, sometimes the same policies that had uh, essentially remained in as we'll explain better now it, in somehow also a relatively ambiguous way within the greater system and that were essentially co-opted and becoming part of a more of the unitary institutional profile um, meaning what that as we've seen especially in the videos about medieval law the sovereign the medieval sovereign 
is uh, that remains such practically up to, in fact, the aforementioned French Revolution and the various the affirmation of the nation state. Um, so the mostly at least in, in civil law countries, the um, with the state as single source of law were actually just normal, say, free people that were elected, chosen by the communities essentially to um, to protect their pre-existing rights, which is a bit, you know, the the familiar concept, especially to to countries of common law, right? And and that was essentially a these were rights eventually already in the middle ages were starting being seen in a ever more kind of national sense meaning that of course this idea stemmed from a universal tradition in which every person was capable in theory of ruling over the entire system even over the entire world in medieval times as we have seen uh Na let's say nations as we intend them in, in a modern sense and not simply the, the nationes of, of, of in a Latin meaning uh, start affirming themselves also in an anti-universal sense right so things started uh, declining as far as the um, the moral dimension attached to the pre-existing order we see in the 14th century the the crisis of the Middle Ages is also a great crisis of the empire, uh, of the papacy. So those institutions that had a claim, in fact, properly a, a universal uh, power over the temporal and spiritual matters, and that um, were starting to, to be challenged in the moment of the crisis, in the moment of the shrinking, by these um, local uh, systems that had... Um, uh, since the existence of the papacy of the empire just developed, right? Some some hadn't properly even existed as such. Certain kingdoms, um, think about the ones formed uh, after the post Carolingian uh, time. I mean, especially talking about France and Germany, in in as much as they came to be distinguished and properly two different kingdoms with the territorial extension that they had, new identities were formed right other were modified right so obviously you can trace some common origins by some degree um, up to you know uh, ancient times right there is really no controversy about it as long as one is able to dimension it correctly however um, but uh, what what we witness is again at the uh, exhaustion of the uh, great medieval civilization uh, starting from the end of the 13th uh, the first half of the 14th century you have um, of course the just the lesser systems consolidate right because it's as if the, the system broke after an effort to keep everything together which is incredibly costly and so uh, the lesser elements begin to rule. These lesser elements are these, mostly these feudal or national monarchies, if you prefer to call them this. Um, and that, that had been born actually in a non-teleological way, right? This is something that, my opinion, has been stressed uh, excessively by a certain type of historiography, but that does contain some important notions. I mean, pick, I don't know, the Kingdom of France. Uh, and that is a good example because we have seen many times that essentially the Franks were just the ones north of the Loire. They had practically nothing to do with um, the, the south that was historically kind of Visigothic, even if you have to draw some, or Burgundian, um, if you have to draw some from the Romano-Germanic background. But um, that managed to, to affirm itself, especially starting from the 13th century, all over what in fact was called after the um, the, the partitions of the Carolingian Empire as the Western Frankish Kingdom that is eventually the Kingdom of France. Well, the literal boom that the Catian monarchy has in the 13th century that makes it, makes it surpass even the, the Holy Roman Empire it, it, that is shrinking uh, instead and there could make interesting comparisons from within, because there were two different countries, right, especially, of course, all the Holy Roman Empire, I'm talking about uh, Germany specifically, um, and that simply need, uh, started 
state building in the 13th century because they had acquired immediately again they had kicked out the Angevins they had almost completely from the entire properly what we call France today and they seized control of Occitania they began interfering even in Burgundy that was technically part uh, of the empire as we've seen recently even those videos about the Dauphiné and also the, the other day we, we discussed partly it would for the Burgundian state uh, anyhow what, what happens is that the administrative governmental practice that is established during the 13th century that we see and especially French historiography that was legitimately in love with um, the, the Capetian accomplishment of the feudal monarchy during the 13th century etc and that at that time was you know expressed through also an important ideology that of course was uh, uh, royalistic and think about the, the cathedrals it, it had actually a universal aim because that was still uh, the actual deal France could uh, the, 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 the same divide between the Empire and the rest of Christendom was not immediately clear right it had been established in a political territorial sense but in, in line of principle even later, the, the French kings would try to, 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 to buy an imperial crown, um, even almost succeeding. There were different kings of the Romans at this point, and, I don't know, Englishmen, uh, Spanish. Um, you have French-speaking uh, Holy Roman emperors of uh, that have as their actual monarchic base a Slavic country, mostly like, like Bohemia. Um, so it was possible to uh, shift, you know, centers of power by a degree. But with the contraction, as we've seen, the crisis requires what the local structures had had um, had accomplished to consolidate for, because the system is being shattered, and that's basically what all, what you have at that point. And so when you look, for example, at at a reign like the one of Philip the Fourth of France. Um, that is being uh, historiography and also the people frankly are ungrateful because they just appreciate those who win who succeed would whatever so they those were the, the good ones just per se and uh, whoever lived in another moment which was uh, dramatic it, it's it's kind of weaker for some reason or uh, it must things must have gone wrong because because it was just a bad ruler um, it ain't quite the the thing especially when there are many other powers involved um, and while of course it is true that there is um, a broader uh, wave that the sovereigns had been surfing even in an ideological way it was being affirmed that the, now in the moment of crisis was crumbling you know, was of course um, denying that same claim uh, what you realize is only at that point that the state is established in a more rigid way in a way that was in fact starting even to look at, at the past by saying you know the, those were the guys we founded that we had that ideology that we read now and this teleolo teleology because they thought that I don't know the country would never arrive at this point and the 14th century the 15th century is the moment of the affirmation of the ancient regime actually of a political and social crystallization um, and thus har hardly of what we have been told like in terms of since the universal system fell apart you know these uh, countries or nations were free fr freer to express themselves it was a greater centrality of the individual it wasn't right it was a very rigid system as a matter of fact um, and even in those countries that somehow were able to inject more uh, for example commercial dynamism or even technological interest etc uh, compared to a to a past in which, first of all, they had been backwards uh, compared to, to the rest of the continent, but that only later would bring to things like the great world empires, etc. Um, doesn't mean that you can read that in a simple, again, teleological sequence, right? Because uh, up to the modern age, some countries were not even properly, like, they may have easily not existed, right? even though they were communities that already had something uh, in fact, uh, defining, identifying, uh, it previously met. Right? Sometimes it's just uh, a sovereign choice, uh, a war, 
etc. That a bit waits us to think that thinking that things would eventually go that way. Um, by the 12th and the 13th century, the the process was of course uh, occurring constructively. So even though a part of what the political and territorial mosaic was defined at that time as well in a non-theological way, um, it's obvious that there was sort of cooperation in making things work on, on the base that already existed and so consolidating them by, by a degree, but also expanding them further. Just the, ex the example of France is quite eloquent. There, there was a, a Carolingian administrative repartition that basically was all that an ensemble up to that point, and only later was reduced by the Capetians who said, well, well technically, in, in the partition of 843, in Ars, the, this, the, the entire thing from, in fact, Belgium to, uh, to, to Catalonia belongs to us, right? And you know that eventually, um, this is not even, in fact, uh, the, the, the boundaries of, of, of today's France, but it, it, it wouldn't be even the ones of the Middle Ages. As, for example, saying before mentioned, Philip IV bail out of the same Catalonia to concentrate on Flanders. And part of Flanders essentially are today's France, while others belong to Belgium. And, and, and so the, the concept there is that these borders are defined gradually over time and with an important degree of kind of randomness. We're just talking about, you know, so the Burgundian state is a bit the one of the best examples. They didn't have the territories that were controlled by the uh, Valois Burgundy weren't already by that time, right? Particularly coherent per se, right? But it helped defining better, for example, a Flemish national identity, which, in fact, even in the previous centuries, wasn't particularly obvious. Uh, in a in a politically uh, unitary uh, direction, right? And still thinking that, again, it's not unitary as much as the nation state is concerned. It's still different communities that start grouping themselves, and that's properly the key to understand what the 12th century, 12th 13th century institutional systems were started doing, right? They weren't trying to enforce uh, a uniform hegemonic homogeneous uh, system. They didn't have the means to, right? They were just asking essentially the various communities to cooperate in a way that, you know, you know through administrative means would to, to, to facilitate a greater effectiveness of making them stick together for good. But it would take literally hundreds and hundreds of years, right? And um, a process of avocation of certain rights were from the perspective of the communities were somehow subcontracted to to the to the ki to the kings because that's where it got down to right. But kings began to um, increase their power exactly because at the end of the day the communities were fine with that, right? Um, I know that much of what I usually say in this regard goes against especially a good, what a good half of Western historiographical tradition actually says, uh, but it's very, you know, mm, politically determined, right? I can't stress the the other direction um, in a, uh, as a reaction. It's obvious that the sovereigns would also abuse of their power, that would govern in, in ruthless ways, and then they would, of course, uh, do so because there weren't many other ways to rule. But this is ex exactly the point, right? As long as they succeeded, it's because somebody was supporting them. And they were supporting them for obvious reasons, for, for reasons that uh, they were able to see at the time would benefit um, them, right? And not just the sovereign per se. And again, nobody can rule if you don't have the size of moral support of, of the population in some way. Right, so eventually the systems can fail too, um, but especially the ones we're looking today wouldn't, because they remained essentially the the base of the even in the contemporary countries that that we know, and this eventually corresponds to a continuity in the saying the good reason for or in the right reason for make things work, right? 
right is better than good, I think. Right, so bear it in mind when you know you live in a world that is just telling you to be compassionate and tolerant of whatever. Is that does that help, actually, uh, or is there a better way? Uh, which is the, the most moral one, by the way, because it can really improve things in an objective way and not uh, just making people weaker, thinking that they're special for some reason, but they're actually becoming ever poorer. It is also a way to, to control them, right? But it weakens the system as a whole, because it means that you lose moral forces by a mass scale uh, in the process. And the same goes uh, for any other type of absolute delegation, right? That's why, I don't know, most in post-socialist countries, the idea is that, you know, give power to to the to, to government and then the people are left uh, just uh, doing whatever they want uh, this is that's also what started being different in, in the middle ages in different areas of Europe right and there is always uh, a reason why certain things happen in a country rather than another and and it's also we can't see the results um, even even today in, in a broader sense but there is a, a way to redemption and to improvement that in fact corresponds sometimes even the history of those countries who lag behind some of the most prosper moment right maybe you can appreciate i don't know uh, the interwar czechoslovakia to have been essentially the only truly non uh, authoritarian dictatorial or totalitarian country yeah, an example a model of you know, border, etc. Until the war, of course, uh, the second one uh, crushed Erfe, uh, because things were starting to work in the right direction. You can even trace back to what to part the Middle Ages, in part the fact that Bohemia had been framed within the Holy Roman Empire, had been profiled with in a particular way. It had been under Habsburgic rule. Nothing is an accident, right? And uh, we should appreciate these actual differences historically, because again. For me, as a European historian, it's kind of obvious that these mechanisms occurred. But um, the way we picture states nowadays, it seems to me like uh, a mimification of the thing. And nobody really looks at the actual roots of countries. I don't know how you approach that or if I'm able to provide any kind of perspective in this regard. But I think it's also... Um, maybe not the single most important thing, but still expressed by the same, meaning um, why, why would you learn history otherwise, right? If you don't know what the major countries in Europe emerged from, or even any other state in the world, because uh, that's what we have to, to deal with, <laughs> you know, where and another, right? I was surprised just last year, that I've been following uh, just comparatively how you know, different states told certain things um, for the sake mostly of internal policy. And I was looking at the fact that CNN and BBC were, well, you know, presenting with um, sensible information, somehow uh, were quite selective in the way they expressed the comment. Of course, we're not talking about uh, high-level information or anything. There, were, there are some minds working behind that in a critical way. There, there is worth listening as, as a perspective. That's not how you actually get the, the, the right information that you need. But, uh, you know, you know, you know what happened in 2022 in Europe? Like, uh, France and Germany, for example, were named just a few times. As if, you know, they didn't have, after all, much of the weight they have. Uh, Italy hardly. Like, just, you know, there were more... Uh, articles like oh, look at those uh, you know castles that they're selling in Italy at a cheap price and, and then you know what what about Italian policy <laughs> you know um, you know the, the, the whole set of the Ukrainian crisis well uh, it's as if a, an entire uh, continent almost was not represented or nor stereotyped in or you know presented to the public just on the base of what they they think uh, you know it's uh, you know, it's emotional enough to, to look at, but, you know, as far as the objective political social dimensions um, does not quite exist, 
Right, and I can understand it, of course, because both the United States and the UK have their own historical um, point of view. But at the same time, I think this is just the adaptation of some also of the major world media to just the radically undereducated average mass of people that um, is not able to understand basically anything aside for it, and, and that fuels their their bias. Um, so hardly actually informing them, but just making them feel to live in a world that doesn't quite exist. And again, I think that in the West, we are the ones who actually portray the world better in absolute terms, both, both morally and scientifically. Um, and this tells you in which degree you should also consider history per se. What, what is history? Sometimes I, I see people like just r still reading sources like, I don't know, in this source from 2,500 years ago, somebody says this, so it's it's a proof that things were the way they said. But d don't you realize that we have, again, three millennia of historiography um, that taught us something, <laughs> you know, uh, in, in the West? M maybe, right? Um, it, it's lacking that way. Um, so, which countries are we, uh, we talking about, uh, specifically? Because here we are mostly looking at kingdoms. Also, a couple of weeks ago, if not wrong, I made a video about European kingdoms and what is that? Ah, but there was also the Bulgarian Sardom. I'm talking about kingdoms. I reiterated multiple times during the video. Don't watch my videos because you think that you want your country to be figured and, you know, exalted because to, to make you feel better. Nobody g gives a shit about where you come from. Nobody, right? I'm glad if you tell me, like, I come from here, hi, right? I appreciate that, but I'm not making history to flatter you wherever you come from. I don't do it, right? I, I give history its due, but it's not to inflate narcissism, right? Watch, understand listen carefully to my content this is not an entertainment channel it's never been it never will right so stay focused so of course the major feudal monarchies that we are talking about which is which is not the entire picture exactly of what happened in ter terms of in fact um civilization right so here we're talking specifically about the institutional apparatuses and the royal officials in monarchic states so we can't pick just uh, anything. Um, well, the answer is pretty obvious. We're talking about the great monarchies of England, of France, essentially the ones of the Iberian Peninsula, so mostly uh, Castile, the crown of Aragon, um, eventually Portugal, and the kingdom of Sicily. Right? These are really... Uh, mm, countries that have a lot in common as far as properly the monarchic status structure is concerned. And it, they would make the various countries taking very different paths with different outcomes, as you understand, right? Uh, think about the, the same Norman creations of England and Sicily, right? And the difference between the UK and Southern Italy nowadays. Um, but that had, first of all, a dramatic level in, in especially the Norman monarchies, simply because they had established themselves on lands that were not feudal before. So a, a degree of centralization was uh, the highest in the Latin Germanic world. Specifically, the Kingdom of Sicily was, right, uh, was actually even more centralized and efficient than the Kingdom of England during the Norman and Swabian uh, times, right, for reasons that, you know, I made a, um, a playlist about... Uh, yeah, medieval Sicily, or medieval southern Italy, too. Um, and, of course, we're talking about great, truly, from a social point of view, feudal monarchies. There was a... Because these systems, even if they were sometimes, as we just said, installed in countries that were not purely feudalized, were eventually feudalized, still. Because uh, the limits of feudalism definitely do stand in decentralization, but... Um, what normal this is what normally what modernists tell you uh, everything in the middle ages would was decentralized and you know um 
how do you think they they got to the modern age? Because somebody, you know, in a completely decentralized Middle Ages, woke up in the morning and said, "Oh wow, we should centralize everything." Yes, yeah, let's make it start in the modern age and let's centralize, right? You know, it, it, every single system centralizes or concentrates power. If you don't, if you think that centralization means literally, I don't know, there is a, a direct um, thread from uh, the, the the throne of the sovereign to the last um, uh, official of the kingdom. But what kind of thread is that, right? How even today's systems, when the state is this, the the sole source of law, um, uh, are they have dramatic means of enforcement of um, territorial control of internal security, etc. Are, are are decentralized. Right, the the guy working for the government, waking up every day at six, going to work. So, you know, what is if, if not like holding like a power that is being given to him um, by someone, and that in that sense can be abused or you know, be being efficient, whatever. Um, the the feudal dimension glues uh, realities that were even more decentralized. Right, one reason why, for example, the Normans conquered Sicily in such an easy way is after all, it was a tranquil um, campaign. It lasted decades, right? Because methodically, it was full of castles. Um, and the system, though, was truly decentralized, right? It was not a feudal system, but essentially the emirs of Palermo hardly ruled. You know, in the east of, of Sicily, or even just in the surroundings of the same capital. The Normans need to centralize it just because they are technically French in everything at that point. Um, but uh, also because they, they knew, they realized that uh, you, if you want to rule, if you want to, first of all, dispose of the dramatically efficient, um, heavy cavalry of, of feudal model etc you, you must uh, live in a society built like that but they managed also to and that's why they were so centralized for Latin Germanic standards to employ the pre-existing communities and to form a balance that could help them you know distributing power um, making the communities ever more dependent on it rather than just being landed there somewhere right we've seen in recently in, in even in English history how problematic that the barons really were throughout all the 12th to 13th century um, sometimes even just for dynastic reasons but also because right uh, there was no much of another way to rule a country that, that just even in the midlands was considered a sort of frontier right um, the, the French struggle like hell as you know um, it's not until the 13th century as you say before the, the Capetians managed to really reaffirm a feudal control over the entire Western Frankish kingdom. Um, the Iberian monarchies are somehow uh, glued together by the struggle against the Muslims because those typhus are in fact divided and there is enough um, uh, let's say threat but also in fact uh, lure like um, people in land to just go against them and so to channel the entire political institutional structure towards the struggle and up to the 13th century not may even though they still did it by some degree but still concentrate against the muslims making the christian monarchies essentially fighting against each other rather than against the muslims that technically after las navas become all vassals of the christians in in uh, in spain so technically that's when the reconquista ends as opposed to 1492 and, and that comes together with the affirmation of especially the, the, the bulkiest, the most solid and properly the most feudal state in Spain that is Cassini, that is the, the great kind of properly continental right power. Aragon was something slightly different, but also um, early directed towards kind of um, um, a monarchic direction. We can't say a centralized one because, you know, it was mostly a a lot of confederal autonomy to the crown of Aragon. We made a video about that. Uh, Portugal would, would develop more similarly like Castilla, also because it basically emanated from, from a chunk of it. Um, and of course, you know, 
many Portuguese would want to kill me at this point. Um, so there are, mm, of course, other powers that would install themselves in late medieval Europe uh, that were based on political territorial entities created during the 12th and 13th century towards concentration of power. One we have seen uh, in different videos from the communal systems. For example, the later Duchy of Milan, that was a title essentially bought by the emperor in exchange of the money that at that point the, uh, the, the, the Germanic rulers required um, uh, more than ever, uh, was based on the expansion of the Milanese commune against the other Lombard ones. Right, so much that the entire region eventually becomes uh, the, the duchy as essentially an hegemonization from the side of, uh, of the Ambrosian city. Right, so grouping territories um, such as, in fact, uh, sometimes even just rural districts, but other cities, seigneurial areas. Uh, and there are other significant powers such as the Duchy of Savoy or that of Burgundy that are also fairly close except Savoy emerges from within the Holy Roman Empire while Burgundy from within uh, France right right um, the latter especially straggling over uh, France and, and the Holy Roman Empire um, there are the um, German princely states as well that in the late Middle Ages emerge actually from realities that were, yes, uh, consolidated over uh, the, the previous centuries, but that hadn't sometimes corresponded to a um, much of a previous, um, for example, public circumscription, and mostly, f uh, in fact, f merely feudal seigneurial private powers by a degree, right? The Habsburgs fundamentally installed themselves on the um, of the previous Duchy of Austria, it was some something relatively new, right, and consolidated in that dramatically efficient way by the 13th century, by the Babenberg House that eventually uh, had um, ex uh, extinguished the same had tried the Bohemians to do. Eventually, their country, uh, ruled by the Vermislers from centuries, becomes the base of a a relatively modest a dynasty like the one of Luxembourg that is literally called by the, by the Bohemian um, uh, nobility as uh, starting from this tradition in fact of election which is also hardly you know uh, from a side of the nobility that is already been surpassed in countries like the aforementioned ones like England, France, Spain, Sicily uh, and then in fact pertain mostly to that kind of broader central European area where Things are a bit like a hybrid, an hybrid, right? Um, so there are lots of other bases. Um, think about Venice or even the Scandinavian monarchies, for that matter, that are consolidated exactly in this period. But they all have a different story, and we will talk about it in in another uh, about them in another video. As we already did tell, uh, as you know. Um, so the creation and the development of complex bureaucratic apparatus at a central level but also a peripheral one and especially I would say that one because without the, the connection with, between the two you would have not had that political territorial control represent the key moments in this subtle development right and this is particularly evident when we consider that the territorial and juridical unification didn't happen by radically substituting the pre-existing institutions, right? All these powers fundamentally act within a channel of political legitimization, right? Th think about the Normans in England. The, the Kingdom of England already existed. Um, the uh, the Western Frankish Kingdom uh, juridically already existed. Uh, even the Kingdom of Sicily is created uh, from scratch by the Papal Crusade that basically tells, look, we, we give you the title of, of rulers in Sicily, even though Sicily is not conquered yet, just go get it, abide as, a, as, a papal, as papal vassals. Um, even the Italian communes start from 
the comital episcopal uh, districts that was, uh, as we have seen, the base through which the Holy Roman Emperors had ruled Italy. Um, so it, th this is important because there is always kind of an overlordship of some sort. Uh, there is even in the lack of a, a true temporal power. For example, the papacy intervenes importantly to essentially strengthen the um, the imperial institutions, right? Even in lands that were not uh, part of what the Holy Roman Empire had come to be, right? Conferring titles, crowns, whatever. We've seen it um, with, uh, for example, in the video made recently about the Lordship of Ireland. Um, so there are uh, interesting, uh, the, the same Reconquista uh, is uh, legitimizing political territorial control in the wake of the, the Crusade, per se. The same could be said, actually, for the same Ultramare state uh, in the East. Um, and the way, however, these states consolidate to a bigger scale happens by grouping uh, through different instruments, jurisdictions, customary traditions that are key here because they were affirmed at some point, often in the High Middle Ages and post Carolingian times, on the base of, you know, there is no emperor or king actually protecting us. We will take matters in, in our own hands of what is established now in a form of lordships and or other you know political connections and juridical ones is just again uh, wanted by God or in this sense naturally based or whatever and so um, we will just fight for it right together with our freedom that nobody could quite alienate unless you know something particularly wrong happened this is uh, just for talking on, on a juridical base Right, that's also how, for example, the Holy Roman Emperors revive, or uh, they try to revive at least their authority in Italy in the 12th century. There was the traditional Fodrum, that is something dating back to Carolingian times, and it was already, uh, you know, actually the, the custom of, of any country where the king, the uh, at least the, 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 the center, because technically the king was to rule as public authority, just like in the Roman. Um, Germanic model, where in theory everything belonged to the king as as a as an official himself, right? The fodrum, right, for for feeding the horses, and this thing is extended to I will take over control over this and that that were maybe originally imperial prerogatives, but that the local communities had developed to a degree that mostly um, was their merit, uh, and that when you know taken away from them, they simply resisted for maintaining and even defeating the imperial army in open field and seeing those rights actually confirmed by the same emperor in the peace of Constance right um, so this system this model uh, of state of composite state is destined to uh, last until the affirmation again of literally the code of Napoleon because even if you look at the enlightenment the reforms of the Habsburgs uh, of the Hohenzollern and, um, and, and more you actually look at again the same principle of avocation most of that was essentially sparing the local communities of the building of the troops that a sovereign through his private means could could found um, to in exchange establish a permanent military that would stay in its own barracks and that's how in fact how Austria and Prussia de facto become important power in that period but it was still negotiated that is to say the king couldn't do that if the subjects had not agreed and it's obvious that the state is important uh, at that point that there is again a um, you know also an imposition and a uniformation a mandatory um, systems introduced but the the point is that the people wants that in a way or another you have been lied to by being told that the state has deprived your rights of but you 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 have it's not just that you gave the state at some point but that you always can take back 
because the state is not made of uh, you know an automaton that simply goes on by itself mysteriously and you have just subjected to this is a super a fort estate superstition that again just nationalists and socialists believe in and that as such of course they remain just the scum of the earth because they have simply surrendered what is the you know the traditional idea is that you you shouldn't be if you really complain about something you should keep your word and not whining about it and actually going there and fighting for it and you're not doing it and that's why the system is standing because you're just a whiner and nothing else and the the truth being that the state actually does work and that all great civilizations are great states at the same time uh, and uh, totalitarian states are not great states they fail they suck right so it has nothing to I know this is yet another political issue because I talk mostly to an audience from from a certain part of the West but uh, it's rhetorical, right? It's designed, it's a anarcho-populistic delusion to make, again, the fourth estate that composes the majority of the population feeling as if they were martyrs, victims, where they're just, again, people who not just fully deserve whichever condition they live in, like anybody, for that matter, but that, of course, they are ever weaker and basically they do not have any power if not actually by not intervening things making states crumble to their own uh, own detriment telling the truth um, naturally there are great problems to govern systems that were born very often just out of a few centuries uh, in a pre-industrial society um, and yet these were the same ones that improved the statal development. We live in a product of that, of a massive millinery problem solving that step by step with enormous difficulties we were able to instate. Um, and that, that's why for example the, the things like loyalty, uh, fealty w w were so important, not just because tradition stressed that in order to maintain that political cohesion you had, of course, to, to be up to, to those standards. But also because you need to rely, in fact, on, on people to, to make it work. Uh, control, order, uh, say, what you could get in resources from the dominions um, was, um, was costly. Right? Uh, most of the system was autonomous in practice you needed to maintain consensus, the adhesion to the monarchy, and there were centrifugal pushes, as you know. Uh, yet this seems to have been, uh, on the longer run, the essentially the only direction we took. Again, people say that you can't theologically talk about this, because you can't talk how the form that these systems shape themselves like, uh, both politically, institutionally, territorially, administratively, but you can easily see that whenever there were resources, moral and material alike, uh, states emerged, right? And the the, the, kind of the, the areas where there were less were more backwards and took way more time to develop. Uh, so what you see during the 12th to 13th century is um, the affirmation also of agents, of officials, that the monarchs um, needed to rely on mostly because um, the nobility so those who detained most of the de facto power were always kind of more reactionary right they tended of course they they backed they supported the monarchs because they understood pretty well that it was an, uh, a good chance to to aggrandize their own power themselves but they were trying essentially to make the system work in a private sense so that you would give private power um, just as long as you personally need it and so whenever the situation for some reason even maybe you were bought by others um, was con more convenient for you you could simply say here there is nothing else standing that binds me right um, so royal officials especially during the 12th 13th century where the uh, urban communities develop particularly so there are ever more literate people um, educated, skilled personnel, they're often from the bourgeoisie. 
and they um, essentially rely on royal power because uh, they wouldn't have a shot in the system otherwise right at those levels said because they're very uh, handsomely rewarded um, they are very often as we've seen in other videos the same um, the same cause of that because they were entrusted by the king with some important power nobody could touch you even though that happened but they had free hands sometimes even to squeeze the local communities with whom they they often also connect in but in a similar way so they their local rulers in their own regard they start increasing to be as such even though of course the nobility is more powerful but they are exactly the mean to counter the nobility um, and their fealties is ensured exactly by this uh, by royal protection per se they weren't individually privately powerful enough to enforce royal authority but royal authority conferred them with those powers and from the forms of, of their exercise um, from um, the their connection with the royal court from their technical and political capacity depended in great part the stability of, of the regimes and of their power right sometimes it's just a matter of rationalization or organization or um, order uh, and inflexibility right it's based on again somebody's fate and courage and determination and, and, and reason uh, you couldn't build a state otherwise this is also the same cause of its in principle you need to channel the uh, greatest forces um, you know towards a, a rational order of things and, and rationalizing the same and disciplining them and so not just letting go wildly out there but the, the nobility had somehow contributed to the same rationalization of the system but also as we've seen uh, recently also with the history of 12th 13th century England they what we think as I don't know a great accomplishment in terms of constitutional culture was actually the the a major loss in capacity of stat statal development for the benefit of the same country right it's in a in a monarchic perspective you can't quite think that I don't know that Magna Carta was a positive event and uh, the point there is that you've been told that uh, the monarchy was bad right you know and so it was right to, to have been restrained but as a matter of fact uh, while this can be true in a, in a broader sense of course that more more individual liberty uh, for percentage of the people can maintain higher collective standards morally it's something that you have to calibrate always and that wasn't just a prerogative of the freer systems because most of the freer systems were also the weaker ones as well right and you can argue that England did become weaker because of that and so it, it must always be balanced right because still there most people lived under a monarch in ways that were all but you know the, the Magna Carta was essentially a baronial uh, issue right not the one of the, the commoners that actually didn't benefit at all from from the situation and in fact this this is this must be also considered you must use some institutional political instruments also to vehiculate more resources that can make paradoxical people better like if you uh, if it wasn't so like the ancien regime that was established um, would have not essentially made states improve or grow uh, which is evidently ridiculous in the modern age um, as an idea so and this is the same reason why again uh, you have been necessarily told that eventually it was during the renaissance the reformation etc the 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 you know the victory of the people you know the improvement individual liberty there was none of that in a strictly formal sense right it was a rigid ancien regime system that left yes an important space but within still some constrictions so you can have a growth within the same and it can actually be an orderly one it's the traditional system after all gives you a discipline a standard in a transcendental um, in fact absolute to relate yourself to that you can argue we we did lose after the 18th to 19th century in great part 
into an important cost, right? So uh, now we are facing problems, especially when you know there is not enough um, expansion of the system for uh, you know from from just like uh, normal human growth, right? What you can uh, expand and also reward uh, the people through a certain point the system slows down and you need to rely on standards that uh, the state just per se cannot fix um, and if this state is based on uh, an ideology that actually counters the same necessity of a hierarchy and of an order as it is traditionally well things can't be incredibly delicate that's also why totalitarian regimes collapse because they're based essentially on a nationalist and socialist ideology at the same time in any regime even the so-called communistic ones uh, that depletes the individual towards a, a, a sub-personal dimension that has nothing to do with what tradition brutally managed to affirm right and what where things fail is not the forms but the strength of people to being up to them that's also why the insane regime collapsed. So, there, in other words, there is no magic system that makes things improving uh, by themselves. It's always up to the single people. So, th this delusion again that it's it's the technology or the model of government that will fix things. It's the people who have to fix things, right? And the more you reason in the aforementioned way, actually, the the more you deplete people of any worth. And thus, you will, they will not be able to find any solution, no system will ever work. The construction of the functionary apparatuses started from one side the need of uh, the net of patrimonial agents of the king and on the prince on the territory, right? You needed to send these people to the various communities, you need uh, them to sustain themselves with some lo resources, either local or central, or both. And as we've seen very often, they, they were a double thread. On the other uh, hand, from the nucleus of uh, offices, d domestic offices title holders, of councillors and of fidelis, right? So people that were more or less just um, clients that around the king and the prince they made up the so-called curia right the court essentially or all this group that he mostly relied on and in the connection between these two dimensions in the forms of control and of link uh, among the two environments that um, besides uh, besides the the, the power and say the strengthening of the court apparatuses and peripheral government the major transformations in the structure of the public institutions have to be identified they obviously brought to a hierarchization of the offices that were essentially scattered on the territory in a, within a net that handed um, uh, to the, the central offices and these um, acquired a new uh, essentially articulation that surpassed the uh, undifferentiated structure of the originary uh, curia regis uh, developing by developing in specialized departments Right. This was a way to, as we've seen before, advocate powers even from some uh, noblemen that had traditionally just made things work or organizationally, etc. And that now were ever more dependent on the, the authority uh, as uh, this was able just to rely on local functionaries that mostly carried out those previous tasks that the, the nobility was kind of more habituated to, to take in, in their own hands. And this is exactly as we were saying before why, for example, in Central Europe, monarchies remained elective. 
right? Because their state building was less advanced, um, and it was just the nobility in a privatistic oligarchic way that mostly uh, dictated the rules. In the aforementioned countries, instead, this wouldn't happen, right? There was probably a firm central institution within which people could essentially make also their own career. They had where the nobility had its own place, right? There is a degree of um, re-feudalization, uh, as we've seen even within this big states of England, France, Spain, Sicily, because of course. Um, um, the, the middle classes had shrunk during the crisis and so noblemen were just the ones that even privately were gathering more power in the process as protectors. But this also favored in the late Middle Ages the consolidation of more robust and unitary uh, institutions because there were essentially less individuals to cope. Territorial control was easier. Like if there was, like instead of having ten noblemen ruling the land, uh, without too much control on each other, um, it, you pass to just three nobles that had governed the whole land. You, yes, these are more dangerous, but just even through matrimonial policies, you can tie them to 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 the throne. You can essentially give them this other room for maneuvering, and in the process, the entire country is ruled essentially on the base of three chunks that are ever more firmly under. The nobleman, it does if you by co-opting them on also by by the king, and also because the people fundamentally have decided that that's kind of the order of things and giving power in that regard. So I think that is quite relevant. Um, and again, it does pass through imposition, but it also passes through merit. It, it also passes through just again, who did have the capacity to make things work? Because most actually of the problems of these monarchies is that there is no money, right? This is obvious. That every government in many ways is always kind of short of money. Um, even today with much greater um, um, growth um, compared, uh, comparatively from, uh, from from industrial times, you realize that we, you know, even, I mean, big expanses have major repercussions on uh, on our systems, and in part of the reason it's because people have become weaker on the process, but at the same time we are able to cooperate further, also more internationally, to to the degree we hadn't been able to do before. So in the times, actually, uh, you know, the medieval times, you can see how m much greater cost the state building had, um, and the reason being that the benefits were much greater in a condition of otherwise perennial instability uh, with much more fragile systems with ridiculous surplus etc really meant right so the necessity of compacting these states was self-evident to to a great degree and that's also when the you know the traditional thinking was even though gradually um, fading but still um, based on the sacrality of these institutions and sacrality of power that was first passing through the universal uh, ones and then to the others uh, pre uh, say pre say hopefully um, and that's why these those same universal institutions had been existing in the first place again we come from a political culture that told us basically the opposite of this all but you cannot explain differently why actually in the moment of greatest fragmentation powers like the empire or the papacy w were at their peak these people needed that order needed that guide needed that authority to turn to right and, and, and it's diametrically opposite with today exactly in an anti-traditional sense it is positive to have a universal empire in case you don't notice. Most people today are phobic towards the concept of imperialism. They don't even distinguish between empires who succeed and empires who fail. And so the natural selection um, in a political sense that literally the imperium embodies. We're not talking about uh, the rejection of Christianity and uh, of religion in a 
in fact in a universal uh, sense um, that was the base of all uh, tradition at the time and that today is demonizes a sort of superstition which is actually the same thing that the, the church was fighting against against in fact anarcho-populistic movements that are essentially all you see today um, in a uh, say in, as a broader temper and background not that again people actually follow up that uh, through actions but um, they they can't uh, essentially side with any other value that would give them tremendous power and at the time that tremendous power was conferred by the church was an incredibly successful institution in that regard so you realize how we have been depleted how um, the the combination of tradition with modern means could give us like could make us decuplicate GDP overnight instead we decided to not be up to tradition because it's tiring, because it's demanding, because it requires your standards. So you soften up, you just think everything works on its own, and so you don't accomplish anything. That's also how tradition died uh, herself. Because people got habituated to the great achievements that their ancestors had uh, accomplished, and then said, okay, well, we don't have to do anything anymore now, right? So we can't have fun. It never ends. Actually, it arguably gets always worse, at least in terms of risks and scale of potential destruction, and that's that's what you should be considering, too. Um, the state building happened also through a change in the nature of the traditional, uh, say, in the competencies in, in the traditional uh, domestic offices, uh, both through the creation of of structures functional to the new tasks uh, and it should be stressed uh, re relative to this that the relentless growth of the uh, apparatus didn't um, was, wasn't carried out uh, but just occasionally uh, through um, through and proper reforms of the existing structures but rather through the superimposition of old and new offices alike or the redistribution of functions among um, organisms that already existed right the, the parliament uh, for example is, is something evidently stemming from the need of a, a representation in this broader dialogue with uh, among the, bar the, the say the, the sovereign and the subjects but these parliaments were say, something that had always existed in Nuce, in a sense. Um, and um, some local parliaments were just, again, being born out of the same reasons and uh, eventually strengthened even institutionally over time. Some, some of regions in Europe within the various states fundamentally have a, a forms of government that derived from the previous ones that were able still were, were able and still are able to dialogue with the higher power right so we still leave much more than we, we actually see in that within that system um, again the French Revolution in continental Europe changed a lot but it, it even the um, in common law, actually, the state acquired an enormous power. It was unprecedented before. Even just by, you can see, sometimes it's not even a matter of forms of government, I mean, or institutional ones, but literally of how much strength you you actually put uh, under that, uh, say, within that effort, uh, per se. So, some achievements are just the fruit of goodwill, of cooperation, and not just of some you number. Know, and the interesting thing about this is that um, at some point you need the state also t to take matters I in its own hands, exactly in, in the broader, more advanced systems where the, the majority has simply grown more dependent on it. That's always a choice. Again, it always depends on the people. It doesn't depend on the state 
per se. It's what the people are willing to make work. You, know, you could stop an entire country just by, I don't know, not going to work in the morning. But also, what is the consequence of that? And so, what choices at that point do we have? You see, being deprived, what we need the most, moments of crisis, is one of the most powerful um, indicators of what we really need to, to work with, but also how much we got habituated um, to not to appreciate anymore as a civilization or accomplishment. So there is a universal direction still, and that's the only possible way through which any earthly power can, can exist. Um, this mechanism we described um, brought in medieval times to naturally the intertwinement of jurisdictions because uh, some power was shared this was normal in feudal times like you could have a lord say two lords ruling over, over uh, sharing a same right for example or ruling having different rights uh, within certain community where well, same community I don't know you drew from the mills you, you drew from the bridge the various tolls um, it was normally negotiated like that and the various communities had technically always uh, a saying this is also the interesting aspect of the story is that um, the Romano-Germanic background of this all was still functioning in as much as of course you could lose your liberty uh, by law etc but the people were not everywhere um, and actually not even in most places but an important part of Europe actually free by tradition especially in the most actually advanced places actually in those were you know that had come from a more recent tribal background to prove the importance of the state you know pre-existing experiences in that regard but people had grown actually somebody else's persons so think about that read books about, I don't know, the Thirty Years' War, Grimmelhaus and Simplicius, Simplicissimus, and compare what, you know, life actually was in different parts of Europe, because it, it's mind-blowing, right? What do you think? Because, you see, one of the greatest problems I have with this uh, kind of revivalism of the, the past or whatever is that people don't realize that, first of all, if you don't know history, you, you will think that there are no differences. And so you can't pretend that there is a sort of inner spirit of people that is magic and superior to others, and you don't actually connect it to what whatever the, the reasons of maybe a um, of such um, um, let's say superficial of such apparent behaviors really were. Thus, they invent the levels of development that did not exist historically. <laughs> Right, that um, you know are hardly self-evident whenever you are approached uh, to the uh, to to the actual political social indicators, and that people don't want to hear. Well, one of the reasons why um, uh, this this trend doesn't want to hear anything historical and also in a comparative sense with other countries etc because very often they, they, they discover that their alleged identity that exists at the time did not exist as they thought they were right most of their identity they have today is something emerging against for the fourth estate from the most severely um, you know underdeveloped and in fact uh, lesser and kept under elements of worlds in which you know those people were considered by the establishment subhuman beings that, that, that didn't give a damn about them they were they married into the foreign royalty was all you know international right and yet I found people that again identify themselves oh this guy loved his nation so much there was not the concept of nation as you think it today you know if this person had seen you as part of this nation would said this is just a disgusting commoner um, and and nothing else, right? you know, you wouldn't feel attached to you because you come from the same country. Um, they l looked at individual quality, which by the nobiliar standards of the time, you just 
you, you're not able to reach again you never will um, so this entire um, obsession for self-validation through uh, an imaginary past and not your actual personal accomplishment is again the same proof of how much again there is an establishment that actually makes things work uh, and that's obviously everybody participates to a degree but that uh, is very different from person to person and I think it's sadly we're confirmed every day right uh, the average person literally doesn't have the paidest idea of how it would even be to, to rule a country or how to act internationally because you know if you believe in all the conspiracy theories that normally paranoid or quasi paranoid people live superstitiously superstitiously under this common places this kind of um, anti-establishment, populism, nationalism, socialism, etc. You realize that, uh, that that's the obvious reaction to the fact that they just live in a world that scares them because they don't understand it. Because literally, you know, if you know how the world works, normally you have a pretty good idea of how we do make things work in spite of what could happen. This, that is still, um, you know. In the measure uh, in the realm of, of possibility is still scary but you know that we managed to to, to make m much more functionally go than what again the completely the responsibilized uneducated and accomplished person does, doesn't properly have them any mean to to actually contribute to and it just basically leaves off of other people's achievements in a parasitic way Right, and the system is hopefully not going back to to feudal times. And even if the, if it did, given that we're witnessing a, a shrinking of the average person's power, well, would it, it wouldn't be the end of the world per se, right? Um, it's just how again you deserve fundamentally to as anyone to to, to become if you are not strong enough to maintain your um, your standards uh, uh, to to a degree that can also successfully counter whatever stays above and where's the limit right it's as easy as that normally successful people rule that that's how that the actual thing goes not always it's not a perfect system the governments reflect the people most of the times but they are definitely as government the most rational element of that people so just think about what that actually means that gives you the scale of the moral and cultural disease uh, in which we actually live all right so today I think we can stop here uh, I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise give a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content and for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.